Welcome to Lithuania. I've never had the chance to say that before. We are at the Cedo Velodrome ahead of the UCI Track Champions League Round 2. And none other than Britain's most successful ever Olympian, Jason Kenny, is here for the fun. Jason, we've been asking people to send us uh, their questions that I'm going to put you on the spot now and ask you for answers for. Your wife, Laura, did this in Mallorca. She was very good, so no pressure. Um, <laughs> obviously, she's very good at a lot of things, isn't she? Um, right, we'll go straight in. And our first question is, what surprised you from the Track Champions League opening race day in Mallorca? You were babysitting, weren't you? I well, was babysitting. Child yeah. sitting. Well, I, well I, don't, I don't think it counts as babysitting. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. Child. Good answer. I was being a parent. <laughs> um, but um, I think how, how quick fire it came around, you know, mm. particularly for the sprinters. Um, it seemed to just be like bang, bang, bang. And, I've, and from watching on the telly, it looked like there were some quite tired legs out there. So it'll be interesting to see if they've adapted to that and, and the kind of things they do to, to, um, to kind of cope with that better. Some of the sprinters I spoke to said that they were surprised by that intensity because they saw the race schedule. They knew how little time there was to recover, but it's very different than putting your body and mind through that, isn't it? It is, yeah, experiencing it. And you can plan as much as you want for it, but then it's not until you experience it, you know. And, and when you're in a race, and you, you come down, you, you, you're all emotional, you know, your heart's pounding, you try and do all the right things. And, and if you've not had time to sort of process that and settle it down before the next race, it, that can be quite hard to do. So like I say, it did look like there were some heavy legs out there. So it'll be interesting to see if they do things with gears or warm ups mm. and warm downs in between to sort of try and mitigate the, uh, the kind of downsides of that as much as possible. Now, I struggle to catch my breath. I don't know how they manage. Anyway, um, Barney DeBerry has asked uh, or said, we as a family will be going to next week's round in London. See you there, Barry. What are the things to look out for that might not be obvious to those new to the sport? That's a really good question because we're hoping to open this up to a wider audience, aren't we? So what should we be looking out for? I think, um, you know, there's not a lot of time between races mm -hmm. here. London's next weekend, obviously, so the riders physically can't really change that much. Um, so it, it's really interesting to p watch the guys, particularly at the front, who are kind of competing for the win, to see if they change anything for next week, you know. So uh, it might be that you've been kind of hoping it would stay together in the scratch race for a sprint, but then obviously this, if you get beat this week in the sprint next mm -hmm. week, you might see someone try something different. So it's really interesting to see who kind of makes a move, who leads the sprint out, things like that. It's, it's like little things like that. Like I say, it's really good having the back-to-back -back races because you get to know people and what they want to do and, and kind of how they want to race so it, it's quite quite good for that and what about in the sprints then because in usual competition formats it's rider on rider it's a two-up sprint here for qualifying we've got three up sprints how does that change things um it, it makes it a lot lower on the track for a start uh -huh. because in a, in a two-up obviously there's just the two of you so if you're both happy to go high the race goes high but whereas in a three up if two of you go high the other person will inevitably sort of at the front be you don't no one really wants to be in three ultimately because it's it's kind of too far to come back from there so the race tends to be lower oh. tends to be a bit longer because like i say no one really wants to be in three and the only way to move up is to do it early which sort of everything gets pushed on it, it's almost it's it's moving towards a kieran oh. away from sort of a traditional sort of two up sprint so if you notice last time all the races were below the blue on the black line winding up which then has an effect on gears and things like that. And I think it favours um, certain people more than others. And we saw some people that we might be used to seeing dominating too much mm. and struggling a little bit. Yeah, it was really interesting. And we have less of the cat and mice until we get to the final as well, don't we? We do, yeah, it's still there, but it's mm. just, it's in this little condensed package yeah. on the black line where you can see people are really cagey. They move a little bit and then they back down because obviously they're worried. You've got two people to worry yeah. about at the end of the day. <laughs> yeah. I think it's a lot harder to control. And in some ways, I think it makes better racing mm. because it's, it, it's, so, it's harder to control. You know, if you're much quicker, in a two-up race, it's, it's hard to get an opportunity as the other person to beat them. But in a three-up race, there can be more opportunities, there's more room for error. And ultimately, if you can put the other person between you and the favourite, yeah, yeah. you've got another body there you, that you can kind of use. So like I say, you're sort of getting towards like a cure in there. Yeah, I love how it changes things. Um, London will be back-to-back -back days. So next weekend, we move on to London and we'll have racing on the Friday and the Saturday. How do you think this will affect the riders in their preparations and on the actual race day? Because we're talking about one night of racing, which is ridiculously intense. And then we come back and do it all again the next day. Yeah, well, I think it will affect, um, it'll probably affect us up here as much as anything because <laughs> yeah. no one's going to want to come for an interview after they've finished racing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So the post show might be a bit hard. Um, but other than that, I think... You're saying that because Laura's on it. Laura's on it, yeah, so I don't have to worry about that. But um, I think, you know, there is just that more pressure on... Um, looking after yourself, you know, the riders, are, they've got to look after themselves here. They've not got teams around them, so they've really got to make sure they're not getting massively dehydrated or going down a massive hole because they haven't got mm. time to then get out of it for tomorrow. So, um, so yeah, there'll just be a lot of pressure on kind of looking after themselves. And also their equipment as well. If they have to change gear for the warm-up the next day, 
do you do it at the end of the day mm -hmm. before you pack up or do you do it the next morning? I don't know. It's all these things the riders, they have to plan themselves because they're on their own. They're having to be more independent. So, you know, it'll, some people will deal with that better than others, I think. Yeah, and that makes a difference, doesn't it? Being unsupported. Massively, yeah, massively. You know, for us, we're used to travelling around with a full team. Mm. Track cycling, one of the big problems with track cycling, which is why this is so good, is that we've, all, we've had a lot of pressure, we've had a lot of focus on not many events mm. and so we tend to go at those events you know full gas whereas this obviously it's great having the back-to-back -back events and I think it sort of lets people relax into it and mm -hmm. try different things um, but it does mean that we're used to going full gas for one big event you know with a full support team and tunnel us. vision exactly yeah. yeah and you're going in with a full team behind you physios coaches mechanics so, uh, so yeah, it is a new challenge for, for some of these riders, for sure. Yeah. I've got a question that's uh, for you specifically, which is which Olympic medal has stood out for you the most and why? I like that. You have enough to choose from there, Jason. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I've always enjoyed team sprints because it's nice to win it as yeah. a team. Um, because uh, it, it, it's just great being up there with your mates, you know. Sometimes, funnily, it's, it, you can almost be quite lonely, particularly if you're a sprint, you know. Like, so when, when I won the sprint in London or in Rio, it's quite... Um, it's almost quite lonely because everyone's gone yeah, home, yeah. you know, the other person sprinting's gone home or whatever sometimes. And it wasn't bad in real actually because I had Callum obviously. But um in London when I was the only one, it was like you're just in the track centre when you're yeah, it's funny, really. yeah. Um so that they could be strangely lonely and like and people are happy, but they're like happy for you. Whereas the team sprint sort of brings everybody in and the whole thing. Because someone to celebrate happy. it with, he understands yeah, it exactly, with you, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it brings the coaches and the staff in because it's such an effort to get that team up to that level. That I think it really brings everyone in and everyone feels a part of that. So yeah, I do enjoy the team. Sprints. And also when you're celebrating, I guess you're aware that everybody's watching you. So when you're doing that together, you can share it. When you're by yourself, doing a little party by yourself, is that a bit different? It, it's a bit <laughs> funny, yeah. That's what I mean. It can be quite lonely. Yeah, you yeah. like stood there and everyone's kind of clapping for you. you know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's like, Yay. But like when you're in the team, like I say, it's, it's a good laugh. It is. So yeah, the team sprints are always good. The podiums are always good fun as well because you've got more people on yeah. there from the other teams as well. I've got a really good question here from Ben Snowball. Why do sprinters need big arms? Kenny and Hoy are stacked and I have no idea why. Surely you just need leg power. I'm tempted to ask you to show us a flash of your arm muscle there. Well, I, <laughs> I don't know what, I don't know. Maybe the, maybe the TV had a few pounds, I don't know. I don't but think it's I've got massive arms. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, they don't, I don't think. I think no. there's an element of potentially at the start, you know, obviously there's a lot of power and you've only got, your arms are the only thing holding you on the bike, you know, obviously pushing with your legs. So you need a good grip and things like that. Um, but after that, you just kind of carry it around. And also, mm. it's the first thing that hits the wind. So you also you almost don't want it to be. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if improved equipment, improved skin suits have maybe been made it slightly more forgiving in that sense. Mm. So that now our skin suits are a lot more efficient at getting through the air. Maybe you can get away with having bigger arms. But traditionally, we, we don't do any upper body. It just sort of happens through the training naturally, through the, the amount of starts we do. Um, that's how we get our strength in our arms. You say you're not stacked, so maybe I'll take you on an arm wrestle later. Are you up for that? <laughs> Absolutely, as long as the camera's not on. <laughs> Don't worry, I think you're going to win that one quite <laughs> safely. Anyway, and we have an action-packed evening of racing here to look forward to. I hope you'll join us. It'll be live on Eurosport and GCN.